Today we're going through the AFC North, one of the best divisions in the NFL. We're going to break down each team, all the opportunities, and talk about some positive touchdown regression for all you positive regression nerds out there. Leave a comment, like the show, and enjoy. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to crush, humiliate, and totally destroy your competition in your fantasy football draft. It's incredibly simple, so let me just break it down for you. Ultimate Draft Kit. The Ultimate Draft Kit for the fantasy footballers is hands down the best fantasy tool in existence. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's got sleepers, it's got busts, injury updates, full projections. This thing's even got full dynasty rankings. Don't overthink this. It's the only wingman you'll need this year. Head over to ultimatedraftkit.com and grab your copy right away. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday, July 6th, happy to be with you, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Mike Wright, Jason Moore, I'm Andy Holloway, Deucer's Alley, it's full. It's all happening, man. Al is here, the judge is here, and the Rapscallion back again. And somewhere, there's a Borgogan. Just in the mist, in the darkness. <laughs> Where he belongs. Floating around. I think he's on the microphone. Say hi, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Oh, oh don't Kyle, you. Yeah. come on. Yeah. Bust it. Oh. oh, man. Oh, he hit, he hit oh, <laughs> Half the audience drops yeah. out. It's no, gone. I don't, I don't blame him. You know, yeah, it's dork. like you're, you're free to leave now. At dork alert. Point, <laughs> you're, you're okay. You can take off. Nothing to see oh, here. Oh boy, oh Kyle! Boy. I made the joke in my head before yeah, you did. Yeah, well, it, so. it's, yeah, it, but that's where it stayed <laughs> because <laughs> sometimes there's thoughts, and it's okay to have them. We have intrusive bad thoughts, but you leave them at thoughts. Yeah. Um, throw the mute on him there, <laughs> Al, and we're good to go. You don't have to take action. We have a great show for you today. AFC North breakdown. This is how you know that football is around the I, corner. It's when, true. When the when the divisional series hits on the fantasy footballers, you know you're going to get good, hard-hitting, deep analysis of these divisions and all these teams, and it means that training camp is mere moments away. Which is so exciting and wild that we're already there. Uh, AFC North today got such good feedback. If you didn't get a chance to listen to the Saturday episode last week... Mayhem. Thank you, Mike. Just Thank if, you. If, if that got you a little uh, PTSD. Uh, anything, yeah, a little bit. Madison flashed before my eyes. But the uh, the mock draft mayhem episode on Saturday, check that out. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Mike threw Jason and I for a loop throughout the draft. We had to react to it, and um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And we're going to do some more of those down the line. We'll probably do quite a few mock drafts over the next month as we get things going. Uh, this week on the Dynasty podcast, which oh, released baby. yesterday, the top 10 wide receiver rankings, and Mike made a big Dynasty trade. He talked about it on the Dynasty podcast. So Big name player, regressive. Go check it out. I, 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 go, I walk you through the entire process of, of how the trade went down. Which, honestly, a lot of people ask about details yep. on mm -hmm. our leagues. And so uh, we didn't have a show that released on the 4th of July. Hopefully everybody out there had a very fun um, relaxing, exciting, whatever. Safe. Safe, yeah. Um, Fourth of July. I mean, it was loud. It's always loud out here. And hot. Hot and loud. <laughs> Happy Fourth, everyone. <laughs> but uh, no episode on, on Tuesday. Why are you relaxing? <laughs> so we had the Dynasty show yesterday, and then today we've got the AFC North breakdown. Lots to talk about there. Um. The Ultimate Draft Kit, you heard it at the top. It is available now, including with the UDK Plus, we have the Draft Analyzer available. So what's the Ultimate Draft Kit? Um, it is the singular resource that you can use to prepare for your drafts 
It has our tier-based rankings inside of them, premium stat projections, player profile videos, something we haven't talked a lot about. It has custom cheat sheet, uh, a custom cheat sheet creator that lets you import your scoring settings, all of our sleepers, breakouts, busts, values, um, really neat tools to mark players, right? Players that you want to stay away from in the draft, players that you want to target. Uh, we added the upside meters to the rankings this year. You've got the consistency charts, which lets you look at players' performances week over week, uh, trying, trying to determine how you kind of build that roster, the nuance of, of drafting reliable players, high upside players. And um, yeah, you have to check it out, ultimatedraftkit.com. A lot of effort from the entire team is put into that product, and it updates all off-season long. So it is not uh, like the magazines arriving in stores these days where it's printed, and then if something changes, well, you're kind of stuck there. Uh, we update it all the time. So ultimatedraftkit.com for that. Let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. Let's start with some great news. Yeah. Saints tight end Foster Moreau, formerly of the Raiders, signed a contract this offseason. He has announced that he is in full remission from Hodgkin's lymphoma. This was a – I mean, the fact that he had Hodgkin's lymphoma was a news – that breaking news story just months ago. And we didn't know if he'd sign with the team, uh, if he'd be back in a year or two. So, I mean, he's a good tight end. He really is. Yeah, he is. And so, along with um, Jawan Johnson, Jawan Johnson, and now you know another bit of news that Taysom Hill hopes his role evolves into more receptions. Mm. We it, all, it we all hope, we yeah, hope for things. It's not going to. Yeah, I mean, but some, I mean, some is going, some is going to hurt Jawan Johnson and Foster Moreau. Like that sounds like a tight end room that you're not going to know where the receptions go week to week. Yeah. Yep. But coming in, I, I thought Jawan Johnson was one of those late round tight ends that I wanted to target. He showed flashes, was great around the goal line. But Foster Moreau is no slouch. You know, he's he's a, a really competent tight end that this team went out and signed for a decent chunk of money. So they will share that workload. And I, unfortunately, that means for fantasy, I, I think both will be mostly irrelevant. Don't forget the connection, right? Because Derek Carr. Foster Moreau. Sure. Um, that's that's obviously one of the reasons they pursued him is the familiarity and, um, you know, 30-plus receptions the last couple of years. Probably not fantasy relevant, but like you said, it's going to hurt the other players. Uh, I guess we have a little bit of – It's hype season. Yeah, it's hype season. I'm not – but it's not like – No, it's hype, not train-worthy. It's not worthy. hype train-worthy. Um, Kevin O'Connell talking about K.J. Osborne. I bring it up because all the discussion around the Vikings has been either – uh, Dalvin Cook leaving or uh, Jordan Addison arriving or Justin Jefferson just being himself. KJ Osborne had some very, very big games last year. Head coach saying he's a real standout during offseason practices, also as a leader on the field. You had games where he had 10 for 157 last year, 7 for 59 and a touchdown. Three of the last four weeks, he was in the top 13. I, I I wonder if there's some sleeper relevance here for possible. Osborne. Yeah, I I personally doubt it a little bit. Not that he won't have decent games or is irrelevant for like if you're doing an underdog best ball league that's going 18 rounds. Uh, it, you know he's been a standout at camp. It's worth noting that Jordan Addison has not been uh to camp. So everything that's being run right now, KJ Osborne is the two. He's getting the opportunity to run in that role. So it's good to hear that he's doing well. It's just rare for a year four wide receiver to really beat. You know, it, it, it can happen, Devontae Parker, but it's not common for a player who hasn't really broken out through three years in his career to to take a leap forward in his fourth year. I would imagine it's more likely that Jordan Addison, their first round rookie pick, is the two. And K.J. Osborne plays the same role he played last year. He's just doing well in Addison's absence right now. Yeah, I think it's a big question mark until Addison's on the field and proves something to us. Undisclosed injury. We don't know yeah, what and, Addison's injury is right now. And, and let's not forget, Justin Jefferson didn't get playing time at the very beginning of his rookie season, and you know who he is. So what I'm saying is like maybe the first three or four weeks of the year, you've got a player you could play in K.J. Osborne. It's It, it yeah, would be unlikely to me that Addison comes out week one with more targets than K.J. Osborne personally. But we'll see what camp looks like. Terrace Marshall Jr. 
I don't know oh, why I bring yeah. him up. This is because it, Kyle put it in here. I, I mean, love Terrace Marshall. I mean, do I read the quotes? Frank, yeah, 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 Frank yeah, yeah. Reich. Yeah, let me hear it. <laughs> Frank Reich saying uh, he's been shown – he shows the capacity to kind of be a big play guy. <laughs> yeah, well, that's some <laughs> – this is Glowing. the Panthers. Thank you, Brooks. <laughs> Who is this, Brooksy? Panthers third year wide receiver, in case you've never heard of Terrace Marshall. You if you listen to this show, I mean he locked jaw. It's, baby. Just, it's so funny because I've I've I brought up Adam Thielen. You guys won't have no interest. We bring up Jonathan Mingo. You pretty much have no interest because uh, the rookie quarterback, and here right. we are with Terrace Marshall, year three. Oh, I have, I have a uh, negative interest. Yeah, to, to be fair, <laughs> yeah, I have, I also have no interest in Terrace Marshall, who last year, when it looked like there was a path forward for him to be the one, because they traded DJ yeah, Moore exactly when they, or no, no, they did no, that in the offseason. Yeah. But um, I traded a second rounder for yeah. Terrace Marshall. I was just gonna call my shot. Maybe he'll take that step forward. And then this offseason, they're like. Terrace Marshall's our one. We got to draft someone. We got to sign age Adam Thielen. We we can't just stay here. And and um yeah, he's going into year three. He's still a baby boy, uh, twenty three years old, just turned twenty three. So he's a very young wide receiver. But um, it's not going to happen for him. KJ Osborne and Terrace Marshall Jr. I'll take Terrace Marshall. What? I'm just not because I think he's better. KJ Osborne's better, but there's still hope to me. That Terrace Marshall can be something special, as opposed to just what do you have think more KJ total. Osborne did last year. Uh, that's a great question. I would guess he had 750 yards and five or six touchdowns. Okay, you actually gave him more than what he had. Okay, well, 650 so. and five had seven touchdowns the year before. 60 receptions. I was. I had a over lot. under 70 receptions for KJ Osborne. Under really? Yeah. That's okay. I you don't like him. You that's, know, that's it, okay. It, I, that's okay. You full don't have disclosure. To, you don't have to like it. Full I disclosure. Um, I think that there is always, you know, the the personal experience. You know, we, we play fantasy. We love fantasy football. Uh, it's not just our job. And I I had a lot of shares of KJ Osborne last year. I saw a path for Adam Thielen stepping away and KJ Osborne in year three to take that step forward. I watched him a lot in those games and rooted for it to happen. And while he had a few big games. It just felt like he didn't have what it takes to to step forward. So it, it might just be my scars of disappointment from last year that is kind of influencing my negativity towards. It Terrence happens. That, I mean, certainly no guarantee for him to take a step forward. I don't know what that offense is going to look like exactly without. I mean, Adam Thielen's been there so long, and Dalvin Cook's been there so long, and we still don't have an answer on the aged Zeke and oh, Hopkins yeah. and Dalvin, and they are waiting to skip training camp yeah they are <laughs> they are waiting to take it slow uh any other news brooksy any other third fourth fifth string wide receivers you want to there talk about a... we, we can talk about romeo dobbs if you want there's there's, there's some hype around him uh, it, like, taking the next step it keeps happening man like this but that's is off season for romeo dobbs right last off season too well he's he's, he's got been off... in the league for one year <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i just mean like this is the time of year that he has predominantly been yeah. talked about he, he yes. had some really good games last year. Uh, yeah. As far as how he started, he started pretty yeah. strong. Yeah, I thought. I mean, I, four for thirty-seven and two for twenty-seven is strong. Eight for seventy-three after that, five for that, forty-seven that and a touchdown that both his, weeks. That was his best game. That so I mean, I mean, he was a rookie, but um, he is getting the hype right now. He's uh, uh, being rumored that he's established the number one target connection. I, I previous to that had him as the target leader here. I still don't think he's the best fantasy asset christian watson is yes. far more explosive uh but i you know i think dobbs is a decent player the question is just can the quarterback support him on a, another piece of news with a quarterback that can support someone have you guys seen the sky Moore height oh no uh now he's getting a little bit of love from andy reed who is coming out saying that he was very good he might be the he might have been the target leader uh through what they've done so far and so he could see him taking a big step forward. But, again, this is just hype, fluff, piece from your head coach. I mean, what do you, what do you, you want need, him to say? No, it, it's good, It's but it's part of the 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 narrative of the offseason. Like, it's hearing it now, you just, okay, I'm going to tune my ear in. Do I hear more in a couple weeks about Sky Moore or Romeo Dobbs? Like, it's it's the steady drumbeat of the offseason. And, it, like, if it keeps going – then that reaches a volume that you should not ignore and that these players are uh, uh, worth your time, worth a late-round draft pick. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's cool to hear. Um, Sky Moore is a player that has tons of potential and just didn't have tons of opportunity last year and then didn't do a lot with the opportunity he had. Well, he, I mean, but he I do, fumbled I, a bunch. I do like him more than, than the first-year Rice, Rice yeah. situation. I agree. Um, Not high. You have, this doesn't change you. No, no. No, it, we, I I don't think. Did we already bet on this? I think we might have already I think we bet did. on this. Yeah. If we didn't, we have in our hearts. <laughs> oh, yes, I suppose we have. All right, moving on. Let's get divisional. Well, Mike said it. Here we go. The divisional breakdown shows. We're ready for an NFL season. Uh, we go through every division. It's kind of a general overview of the teams. We look at off-season changes from 2022 to this year, 2023. Um, maybe we discuss the ways that the offense could function. And uh, eventually we will weigh in on who we think will take this division down. Last year, the Bengals won the division at 12-4. and 12-4 and four because they didn't play. They had one fewer game than everybody yeah. else. Baltimore, 10-7. and seven. Pittsburgh, 9-8. and eight. The Browns at 7-10. and 10. Fun fact of the division, all four teams went 3-3 three and three in the division last year. So when playing one another, they all had the same record. Interesting. And they are the only division this upcoming year where all four teams are projected for over eight and a half wins. It makes sense. This is probably the best division in the NFL, I mean, you there, there's I think there's like three divisions you could you could argue for, but to me, if Voldemort can step up, and we'll we'll get to the Browns here in a minute, then it's just four really really well run teams. It's why, and I'm sure Tomlin will spend the year proving me wrong, but it's why I'm really not enthusiastic about the Steelers taking a big step forward is because they have a monumental quarterback gap compared to the other three teams in the division. Um, Lamar, Burrow, Watson, proven, established, elite quarterback play. A step up for Kenny Pickett, even to the point where we're like, yeah, not so bad, would still be so far below it. that. But Tomlin proves us wrong every year, so we'll see what happens. I'm curious where you guys will have the division uh, in terms of top to bottom, we might all have the same winner. I don't know. But let's start with Cincinnati. Last year had a preseason win total of 10. This year it is 11 and a half. Ended the year on an eight-game winning streak. It was um, it was another great year. And they, you know, they have such consistency on that offense. You know what to expect when you talk about fantasy football and projecting things. I really like when I have to talk about Joe Burrow and T Higgins and Jamar Chase and the expectations there, they added Irv Smith at tight end. They lost Hayden Hurst at tight end. They lost to Maj P Ryan. And so a couple of the question marks on this team are going to be, could you find uh, fantasy value at the tight end position this year? It was intermittent two years ago with uh, CJ Uzama. It was intermittent last year with Hayden Hurst. I imagine that's where we're headed with Irv Smith. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I'm not, you know, I, I won't go crazy with it. You know, let Irv swerve when the the we'll see if we can, if that gets uh, going there on Twitter again for this year. But it will. There's just I don't know that there's enough to go around because you you have such a high concentration of the targets to to Higgins and Chase. Last year we're talking uh, they vacated 86 targets to the tight end position uh, for for. The, the possibility of Irv Smith and Tyler Boyd is is still there and then the running backs I mean I think they're just they can they're, they they play cleanup duty at for the tight end position over there so should you find yourself in a like a, a really juicy matchup then you can be willing to to go in but it's it's hard to see a world where Irv Smith is like a a weekly plug and play type of a of a of a sleeper at the tight end position. No, I I would agree with you. I don't think he's going to be a locked and loaded guy. Anyone outside of the top three or four tight ends aren't really locked and loaded where you just ignore the position. But I do think that there will be weeks. I mean, we, you, you know, Andy, you just mentioned uh, C.J. Uzama. He won people a lot of money on the right weeks when you play the DFS lineup and you get that double touchdown game. You want a quarterback like Joe Burrow, someone that, you know, 34 touchdowns two years ago, 35 touchdowns this last year. And and the narrative that we were talking about with Joe Burrow 
last year was will they allow him to truly take the team over and because it, it feels almost silly now to remember right. those questions because they did he went from 400 passing attempts his rookie year to 520 to 606 passing attempts this last year it's his team this is a pass first team and with their weapons they're 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 going to be outstanding I know we have kind of grouped him together with Justin Herbert a little bit for fantasy purposes those mostly pocket quarterbacks that are going to throw you know 5,000 yards and can throw 40 touchdowns and but also you have to throw 35 plus touchdowns to really uh pay off on the on the fantasy value you know it, it he's done it the last two years yeah I mean it reminds me of Stafford in Detroit with Calvin Johnson when you have kind of a top five wide receiver physical force touchdown maker in Jamar Chase and then a a very good wide receiver in T Higgins it assures a, a pretty good baseline I mean we trusted before last year, obviously, the age caught up to him. But we trusted Tom Brady in Tampa, pocket passer, elite weapons in Godwin and Evans. Feels similar to me. Zach Taylor's fifth year, he's gone from two wins to four wins to 10 wins to 12 wins. Ooh, 14 wins in Could have easily been fired after a two or four win season. Right. They stuck with him. And like you said, he got out of the way. He let Joe Burrow take this team over. Second in pass rate of over expectation. Second in expected points per play. Burrow last year, he was great. Second in passing touchdowns, fourth in fancy points per game, fifth in passing yards. Is the third round too rich for him in terms yes. of fantasy decision making? Yep. Yeah. I, I, have you drafted him anywhere? Um, I don't think so. I don't think I have. I mean, I, I'd love to have Joe Burrow on my team, but the the investment of a third rounder, that's that, that's too much for me. How are you guys handling – the backup running situation or running back situation. Samaji P. Ryan gone. We don't know exactly who it will be. They did take Chase Brown in the fifth round, I believe, this year. And Travion Williams just keeps keeps an NFL career going. He has done very, very, very little yeah, in mean, his career. We're talking, we're heading into year five here. And he has seen. 57 opportunities in yep. his career but he's he is back yet again and there is a, there's there's room on the Bengals for a backup for the backup running back to do something for sure I mean you saw Samaj P. Ryan be very relevant last year um and Samaj is gone so someone here matters and They've talked up uh, Travion Williams yeah, they quite, quite a bit, but I am personally ignoring that. They've had all the opportunity in the world to allow him to do something. They they had games where Joe Mixon missed last year, and Travion was on the roster and healthy and active. He had six total carries. Like I, I don't I don't think that he is the. I don't think they really actually like him. I would put my money more on the incoming rookie. That's assuming that Joe Mixon is yeah, in and, tow. And and that's why I don't agree with the contention that someone's going to matter. I don't think somebody has to matter here out of that group because Samaj P. Ryan's influence was trust. I mean, third down, high-value situations. I don't know what their trust level is with a rookie on third down, and I certainly have seen Travion Williams for a couple of years. This is a prime destination for a late training camp, preseason, uh, sure. trustworthy back to come in. And right now – you know, there was some news over the past weekend. Both sides, Mixon and the Bengals, want a resolution to his situation soon. All signs point to him being coming back at this point and being the running back. They've made no effort to secure somebody else for that situation. So if you took a shot on him in best ball this offseason, I think your odds of it hitting is going to be very high. And, look, if he, he can catch the football. There's nothing wrong with Joe Mixon catching the football. So – if they don't trust those other two guys to pass block the way I mean P Ryan has always scored very high in that in that area. So I was a little surprised they didn't bring him back. But I think it's possible Joe Mixon, just like Nick Chubb this year, where they had tremendous trust in uh Kareem Hunt. Hunt's gone and you don't know who the next guy is and whether you trust him on third down. So Chubb might get more targets, and I think Mixon could surprise. Yeah, I mean, the, what you want for fantasy is you want depth charts that look like this. You want right. a, a dude 
and then just complete unknowns that have done nothing in the NFL and have no draft capital or investment there. Uh, that that's uh, two of the teams in this division. So yeah, I, you know, there it's still a volatile pick to look at Mixon right now because you know the quote is they want a resolution soon. Well, the other side of that is that means it's unresolved right. uh, currently. So uh, still a little bit of risk, but. This isn't like an injury risk where you know a player is incapable in this moment and you're buying a dip. This is a situation where you're you're taking a an educated gamble that the resolution will come. I believe it will and then it it should play off because he's just his opportunity for scoring on this offense with this depth chart is outstanding. Yeah, there there are a lot of backup running back situations that don't play out like Samaj P. Ryan and they play out like, you know, Arizona last year where it's James Conner, and then it's just, okay, here, Corey Clement gets some carries. Keontae Ingram gets some carries. Oh, Eno Benjamin, we're going to give you 70 and then cut you, and then, you know, right. it's just kind of a mess. And um, if Travion didn't have so much time in the league, I guess it'd be easier to get behind it. Jamar Chase and T. Higgins? Yes. That's just your, that's yes. your an analysis is I yes? Think, yeah, I don't, think the, I don't think we need to dive too deep into that. Um, Tyler Boyd, contract year? Um, Charlie Jones added to the roster. I don't think I think Tyler Boyd is exactly the same category as you would have with like Irv Smith, which is the matchups right, an injury to the the players ahead of him, and maybe you roll him in there and hope you get one of those be deep throws. Yep. Sure, is that fair? Yeah. Um, and their first four matchups: Cleveland, Baltimore. So two divisional matchups okay. to start the year, including on the road in Cleveland. Um, that'll probably be a Pretty interesting game there where Cleveland has uh, Watson coming into really his first year with an offseason program. All right, quick break and back with the Ravens. Let's talk about Baltimore. Uh, this team had so much unknown to begin the offseason. Uh, last year, their preseason win total was 9.5. They went 10-7. And, seven. and uh, they finished the year with Tyler Huntley and Anthony Brown starting games at quarterback. That has been kind of how they choose to end the year the last couple of years. Um, you, we're talking about Tyler Huntley, a pro bowler, uh, too much at the end of these years. This year, the win total is the same, 9.5. But when we began this offseason, we didn't know if Lamar would be back. We also didn't have really any wide receiver core to speak of. And, um, you know, most of our discussion was what are they going to do and is J.K. Two-Leg Dobbins going to be important? Lamar's back. Five-year, 190 guaranteed. Mike, you have him the highest in our rankings right now at three. Uh, he's ranked at five uh, when you look at our consensus rankings. He's being drafted at five. I don't have any problem taking the shot at him at three. I do think it is very risky with the last couple of years. And even though the right wide receiver room looks better with names, I'm not sure exactly what they have right now because, you know, I know we've, we've talked about, Hey, we're kind of excited about Zay flowers, but that's a rookie. Yeah. Uh, Rashad Bateman has had many flashes, but many M a N Y injuries. And then you have Odell Beckham with the big contract. And then there's been video. I don't know if you've seen that of Beckham, and uh, looking like vintage Beckham Ooh, in camp. He's got some good Allen Robinson video. <laughs> Actually, it was the wide receiver coach uh, watching him do a couple one-handed catches and then saying, oh, man, I like that, I like that. And then all the other receivers saying, no, you don't. Yeah. You always tell us not to do that. Yeah, well, I was going to be <laughs> shocked. And then, he goes, and then he goes, but him, for him I do. Yeah, I say the coaches, I mean, uh, I mean, they cannot like that at all. I was like – I guess. Look, if Did you ever gonna, hear that story with Peyton Manning, no. If, he, if one of his wide receivers caught a one-handed catch, he he had him benched. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but he, unless he, it's hey, Odell Beckham Jr. Unless it's Odell Beckham, who earned, yeah. I guess, he, he earned like tenure. Yeah, with one catch. But it's like, it, look. Sometimes there's your only attempt at a ball is a one-handed catch. But catch with you, you got two hands. Use them both. I'm very excited for this team with the the switch of the offensive coordinator. We have Todd Monken who's coming in. Uh, he's been in college the last couple years. You know, uh, Georgia, you may have uh, heard them having some 
Success some success recently. Lately. A couple of championships. Uh, but we're we're going to have a pass-heavy approach. Well, at least, so here's what has happened. Todd Monken, went, in his time in the NFL, has been very pass-heavy, very uh, high on the pass over expectation. So, like, it, like if it's a neutral get situation, Todd Monken likes to pass. You know, he likes to air it out. That's what we, the information we had coming into it. Now we already have confirmation from the small amounts of practicing that the Ravens have been doing from Lamar saying, oh, yeah, we're going to be throwing the ball a whole lot more than we were with Greg Roman as our offensive coordinator. That's huge because we, we want more points coming through the air for Lamar Jackson. On top of that, Todd Monken's offense is going to move faster. Mm -hmm. You had you had the snail pace of Greg Roman where we're not throwing enough, and on top of that, we're intentionally trying to slow the game down. Let's get more plays in there. More passing attempts will turn into – like that won't take away rushing attempts from Lamar Jackson. You're going to have – uh, Lamar still do his things of the first read, second read's not there. I'm going to go. Like Lamar Jackson is still part of who he is as a quarterback. I think he's going to run a ton. The I like his wide receivers very. We're at the point, yes, we don't know who it's going to be. We aren't sure that these guys aren't fully proven in the NFL, but we've seen enough from, I've seen, I should say, enough from Rashad Bateman to know this guy can play. He can make some things happen. Odell Beckham, I'm less bullish on. I think that, that that time has come and gone. But with Rashad Bateman, Mark Andrews, and then Zay Flowers getting some time to acclimate and be a super stud route running wide receiver, I am I'm very, very excited for all fantasy possibilities for not just Lamar Jackson, but the Ravens uh, as a team. The, the possibilities word is important, and I, I think I'm the least – excited of the three of us I see the path there's no doubt I mean he had a 36 touchdown year in 2019 however the performance on the field hasn't been I mean you can blame an offensive coordinator all you want he's still made mistakes he's fumbled the football 16 touchdowns 17 touchdowns he's a DNR consistency 35 percent of his games are in a place where fantasy players are excited about him in his last 17 Sure, but so there's a lot of things that you can blame, but this is not one year. This is three years where people have been disappointed. They've been disappointed in the pick three consecutive years in Lamar Jackson. So I can see the path, but I don't want that to be ignored. Like I feel like we have been wanting good for J Lamar in personnel and coaching for so long that imb we're imbuing only a good scenario. And I guess I'm saying like, what's the I mean, how do we get the same that we've gotten from this team? Because he's been 10, 15, and 14 the last three years. Well, he's he's missed games, and obviously if he misses games, he's not going to be a, a top 12 quarterback. On a, on a per and that's a huge risk. I mean, yeah. A massive risk for him. Sure. I mean, it's a massive risk for a lot of mobile quarterbacks, but the mobile quarterbacks are the ones we're taking the, the risk on. You want a guy who can finish as the number one quarterback, and Lamar Jackson absolutely can't. On a per-touch basis, he scores a ton of fantasy points. He doesn't touch the ball enough because they run so slow. Mike brought it up, but it's worth you know repeating. The pace of play to me is the most important thing on the offensive. Twenty eighth in pace of play last year. Exactly. I mean, this is a this has been a team that has run one of the slowest, sluggish offenses. And when you listen to the players talk, uh, yeah, I know the the some of the quotes were, "Oh, we're going to throw more, run less." But most of the quotes, if you really are listening, they're all about playing faster, about pace of play, about speed, speeding the game up. That's what I am so excited about. And, yeah, we don't know if Bateman is great. We don't know if Odell Beckham still got it. We don't know if Zay Flowers is going to be uh, good enough to be worthy of that first-round pick. But what we do know is that those op options are way better than what he has dealt with recently, especially last year. When he had Mark Andrews and Hollywood Brown, he was the number one you know, quarterback in fantasy. We know he doesn't need a ton. He's got Mark Andrews. So now this trifecta of options at wide receiver, like I am fully in on Lamar Jackson. I, I completely understand what Andy's saying, that there's risk with injury and that he's disappointed for a couple years in a row. But when I'm trying to play fantasy, he's going to play this entire season age 26. He is a young, prime athlete who can run the ball, is going to play faster, and I think he'll turn the ball over a little bit more in this new offense, but we've seen that before with this coordinator where it works out pretty well for fantasy. Maybe not as well for winning football games, but uh, I'm, yeah. I'm 
completely in on. I'm not spending a third round pick on Lamar. I'm not doing that. Yeah, I mean, would it, you do? Would you take any quarterback in the third? Who's going there? I should say, like you, are you willing well, to Bur take I Burrow would, in the third? I think, I think that I'd take Burrow's going like a three eleven. So my, if you had asked me that on Burrow, I would have said if he slips into the fourth, I'm thinking That's about so Joe. I'm thinking about disaster. Joe Burrow. Um, the target is like Herbert later. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. You know, I'm not saying the. Don't. It, I'm saying it's interesting. In the third. I'm looking at teams that ran the most plays last year, and it's not like a, a laundry list of fantasy quarterback champions in terms of of total plays. I mean, you have to have both efficiency and pace of play. You you need both. But that's where I'm excited because Lamar Jackson is efficient on on his fantasy value. But I you know just because you play fast doesn't mean you're a good team. Yeah, I mean like the Chargers, they were like number two. Tampa's number one. We we struggled with both of those quarterbacks. Arizona was number three. Obviously Kyler eventually went out. Washington was four in total plays per game. Washington didn't have a big performance. So you're right. It has to be efficiency um but I, I guess the area of excitement with baltimore that confuses me is is that everybody's going to be great mark See, andrews is going to be great job dobbins is supposed to be great lamar's supposed to be great bateman's supposed to be great zay's supposed to be great that's not going to happen no it's and not, not in this division this division is brutal we just talked about that th that's where to me i'm in on lamar jackson because i don't know if it's a flowers i don't know if it's bateman if he's healthy i don't know if odo beckham still got it they sure are paying him like he's still got it i'm not sure but I know that they all their fantasy points goes back to Lamar Jackson. If any one of them is great and Mark Andrews is good, uh, so I'm I'm in on the Ravens in general. But that doesn't mean I'm in on every single player. It, it to me, it's Mark Andrews and Lamar Jackson are the two that I want pieces of. Do you think there is a chance at all that it's not Bateman, it's not Flowers, it's not Beckham, it's Isaiah Likely? Yeah, I mean, I I love Isaiah Likely. It's Who? my it's my case against Mark Andrews being guaranteed elite, is because he's a talented player that'll demand some targets. Because he's coming into his second year, Isaiah Likely, the the yeah, he's the other tight end in Baltimore. He the other guy. He he, he had you know it's just very yeah, athletic. At least a, an I'm athletic to think, player. Yeah, he had a, a few games. You know, you had week eight, six for seventy seven with a score. You had the the it final the, week. It was the Andrews missing. Yeah, games. yeah, the, yeah. The final week of the season. But that's the point of mm -hmm. if. If in your first year as a rookie, when you are thrust into being the main guy for that team, and you then you come through, it's he he is he's interesting to me, and I'm I'm curious if we'll be talking about him like in the middle of the season. We have not talked about Nelson Aguilar, but he has been yeah, that, yes. he has been talked yes. about yeah, yeah, by yeah, yeah. Yeah. the coaching staff as well. So uh, to Jason's point about liking Lamar, distribution of targets may be more difficult to predict. You're just trusting Lamar to put up numbers with whomever he's given last year it was like demarcus robinson was the player you were starting because that was the last man up um and speaking they get, i mean they get to open against the houston texans they so do at home part of a like, part of fantasy if you want to play the just the the mind game of he will not have a bad game in week one <laughs> yeah he will not <laughs> that's that was my point of sometimes it's tough when you have these guys you love them long term but you know that drafting them oh my god Gosh, look at these first two games. This is gonna. I'm gonna have to suffer through this. I'm gonna have to deal with the mental attack of going through those two weeks of, wait, what, did I screw this up? Was this was this a bad pick because the schedule was so tough to yeah, start? I believe last year, the Lamar had a monster week one. He, yeah, oh, he, he started, was the number one quarterback. I think that, week one and week two. He, he was, started he on started fire. Very hot. I guess I I am just I am fatigued because that you can uh, after an MVP year. You can always look at the next season and say he's going to be an MVP again. It's just been a long, long time since we've been happy with it. It it has been. I, I think I mean, it'll come through. But it's 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 worth at least bringing up because we're talking about the Houston Texans schedule. Last year, the Houston Texans were one of the absolute worst teams to play a quarterback against because they were so bad and running backs had such an easy time. And by halftime, you were up multiple scores. I remember – eventually learning the lesson of yeah the yep. Texans suck but you cannot play a quarterback against them I remember yep. it was uh yep. Trevor Lawrence at the end of the year had just a great four match. points or four something points like yeah. but, and not because he played bad yeah. because they didn't need him they played a half um all three wide receivers that we talked about and I'm gonna make it brief Bateman Flowers Beckham we're just gonna call them exactly tight in ADP because they basically yeah. are. right lock one into your lineup today I I think I still lean Rashad Bateman. Um, I don't like the fact that he's coming off the Liz Frank injury. 
uh, talking. We we talked uh, Rashad Bateman on the the Dynasty podcast, and and Matthew Betts, our injury guy, was on there saying expect a slower start to the season for Rashad Bateman, especially with the news that he had the uh, uh, the cortisol shot into the foot. Uh, Betts was saying that is not normal for the recovery of the Liz Frank, so that is something to pay attention to. But I did like that. Lamar Jackson was quite vocal of, of saying Rashad Bateman is my number one wide receiver. Um, I'll take the last one drafted. That would be Odell Beckham right now by eighty. Yeah, wh- whatever happens in my draft, I will take the last shot. It's ironic. I will. I will take Zay Flowers. So, and and in truth, I'll take none of them. I don't want one of these wide receivers. I don't believe one of them will have a phenomenal year. Uh, J.K. Dobbins, uh, right now. He's going to be the guy. We're talking about this team completely transforming their offensive philosophy. You have a quarterback that can score around the goal line. You have Jacob Dobbins that doesn't catch passes. I have him much lower than both of you guys. Yeah. Um, I think you are trusting the offense to just provide opportunities throughout the year. It's not necessarily going to be predictable, but he'll have a big run. He'll have a big play. He'll have a big touchdown. I don't. I don't love drafting guys that can be touchdown vultured and don't catch the the ball. So I get it if you want to be out on J.K. Dobbins. Why I've got him ranked higher is because I believe the offense is going to be good. They've got an awesome offensive line, and what we've seen from Dobbins has been great every time he's been on the field. Yes. And now two years recovered from that injury, I think we're going to see the best version of him. But I don't mind passing on him for other guys if if you don't if you want a pass catcher. Yep, yeah, it's offense talent. And you love Mark Andrews. I do love Mark Andrews. Yeah. Mark Andrews, I'm in on. Like Mark Andrews, if and J.K. Dobbins. No, I don't love J.K. Dobbins. I, I'm, I thought I, you just said I love J.K. Dobbins. That wasn't the quote. I don't, I don't know. Think I, I don't listen that. most of the time. Okay. Just yeah, no, I don't blame you, but I don't believe I, I use those words. Maybe you don't like the whiteouts. I don't like the whiteouts. Yeah. Steelers are nine and eight. Preseason win total last year seven and a half. This year is eight and a half. I still think it's going to be a rough road for this team. They, But, I mean, look, if you need to fix a problem, bring in a guy like Allen Robinson to yeah. your roster. Subtraction by addition. Uh, that is the the big offseason addition, including a third-round tight end. Kenny Pickett is the quarterback. Went 6-2 and two in his eight starts, his final eight starts. Posted a 1.8% touchdown rate. Nice. Um, was clutch at leading them to field goals over those last eight games. So, um, you know, the average for a sophomore first round quarterback is 4.6. So he's, he, he should go up because what he did was impossible defying, low. defying all logic. I, I can tell you that and it, it's going to kill Steelers fans because I've talked to them. They truly believe that Kenny Pickett is, is going to be the future. I'm not willing to say that right now. Um, I think you're going to need a lot more from Kenny Pickett to remotely compete in this division. Can he beat Joe Burrow in a shootout? No. Can he beat Lamar Jackson? No, uh, not like, in an offensive in, in shootout. shootouts. No, but no, that's... in a game where you need a big score, that was his biggest weakness last year. This team won on the defensive side of the football. They were 26th in points per game, 23rd in yards, 32nd in passing touchdowns, like we're talking about, 24th in passing yards. Um, I mean, are you take eight and a half wins? How many other winning? That's their line. I think they win more because Tomlin will find a way to win more than he loses, which would require nine victories. Is that uh, your so you go nine? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, I sure nine's fine, but um, you know, you just talked about all the confidence you have in Lamar with the system, finding the weapons. I don't have that here. So I'm trusting the players that I know have produced in the past. I'm not going to – I'm not really excited about George Pickens because the volume of opportunities is worrisome to me, and they did bring in Allen Robinson. Remember, Allen Robinson gets targeted a lot. He may not catch it, but he's going to demand time on the field, and I love Pat Fryermuth. So from a target perspective, Deontay, Fryermuth, and Allen Robinson, I think will have more targets than George Pickens. Do you guys – do you have a uh, a different view where you you see Pickens as a sleeper? Uh, I don't see Pickens as as a sleeper. He obviously had amazing highlight reel performances as a rookie, but when you look at the pecking order and the target volume, I do believe that he is down a little lower. I'd have him above Allen Robinson, 
um, you know, even still, there's not enough volume for me to really want to go in on him. The way that I view this offense is a middle-of-the-pack offense, and the way that they were last year was a bottom-of-the-pack offense. So that still provides value. It's not – this isn't a team like the Bengals where you're saying this guy can be top five and this guy can be top five and, you know, just absolutely put, putting up 5,000 yards and 40 touchdowns from the quarterback. That's not going to happen here, but you're not drafting them like that. You've got, I think, nerfed draft capital in the Steelers – because of Deontay Johnson's bad year, you're drafting him basically at his floor. Because of Najee's bad year, Jalen Warren's um, showing, people aren't wanting him. I've I've grabbed Najee a lot in the fourth round, where I think that's an excellent value for a guy that I believe is going to be much improved with an offensive line that made massive improvements, huge contracts in the off season, first round draft capital, and they had the sixth offensive lineman. Um, in their their rookie tight end Darnell Washington, who's going to be added to the line. I you know I I I think there's a well run team that's going to do enough, and they're going to score fantasy points, and they don't cost a lot. So I see them as small wins. San Francisco to start the year Yay. for Pittsburgh. Then they're Cleveland. They're both home games, luckily. And then uh, Raiders in Houston after that. But week one will be um, the ultimate test for yeah. Kenny, for Kenny Pickett, possible. So trade for Najee after week one. <laughs> Got it. Potentially. Um, yeah, Najee, we've talked about him and Jalen Warren in the past. Najee is a volume play. That's what he's been thus far. Year one, it was a tremendous amount of receptions uh, that really made – that launched him into, I think, a top five finish, right? Wasn't he – Five or six. Yeah, he, he was way up there. Efficiency on the ground hasn't been there. Jason likes the offensive line. Yeah, he was number four. And number 14 last year, good into the season, um, seemed healthier. Still nervous about a team that, that was 26 in points per game, me personally. Like, that's just not part of my draft recipe. Um, so if I have an opportunity to take a running back at a similar range that I think has a higher offensive potential. I mean, they were still 11th in rushing touchdowns. Like the it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, balanced out by the 30 seconds well, I, in passing touchdowns. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, you can't have – you can't have the efficiency of Kenny Pickett improve unless the entire team gets much better in total touchdowns and still have Najee score that much. But he's going to get the ball around the goal line. Who's going in his range? I'd be curious about whether I'm telling the truth about who I'd take. I will pull that up for you. Right now he's 306 in drafts is what I'm seeing. Yeah, so right around Najee, you've got Travis Etienne, Kenneth Walker, and Jameer Gibbs going right behind him. Yeah, I mean, at two of those three, I'll definitely take over Najee, um, Etienne, and, and Gibbs. Uh, the other one was Kenneth Walker. Walker, probably. I lean Najee over all of those guys personally, but I, My, there, you can make easy arguments both ways. That is, man, I think I think of those four guys, I'll still take Najee. Does it? I I won't argue with the Jalen Warren. Looks great when he's on a football field, but. Mike Tomlin, just for the entirety of his career, there's there is something about having a a big, durable back that you can have on the field for the majority of snaps. There's something about that that Mike Tomlin likes for his offense. The Browns, they went seven and ten last year. That was their preseason win total was seven wins. This year it's nine and a half, which puts them a game over the Steelers. I'll take the under. Uh, no, I'm, I'm in, I'm in on this offense. Um, I think, you know, Deshaun Watson is a proven commodity at quarterback, multiple years of success. You have an outstanding, maybe the best running back in football. You have a, uh, probably underrated wide receiver room right now. Although there has been some talk about, uh, frustration that they didn't bring in Hopkins. We didn't really talk about Cleveland as a destination, but that would have really, I think that would change the way we look at this receiver room in general because right now it's Amari Cooper uh the potential of Elijah Moore Donovan Peoples-Jones uh David Njoku is somebody that I think we all believe in the athleticism and the potential yep. of this year so a sleeper tight end is in the works there um this is year four for Kevin Stefanski he has done the opposite 11 wins eight wins seven wins but no I I, I may stand alone but I 
Oh, no, Mike and I both have Deshaun Watson at QB9 right now. But yeah, I think he fine. has tremendous upside. Tremendous. Well, he certainly does. I, I would not argue with anyone that he doesn't have the upside. When you look at a guy who started his career sophomore year was the quarterback five, then the quarterback five, then the quarterback five, uh, obviously we know his potential. It's to be the quarterback five. Um, <laughs> but that's three years ago now. What we saw last year was a rusty version of him. No offseason program, no practices, just thrown right into it. So I don't blame him for looking bad. But he it has to be said, he looked bad. Like, th individual throws, just not at a professional quarterback level. Uh, this is a team that, you know, if they, they were hot. They were playing well. They were winning games. And then Watson came in and... <laughs> You know, it just didn't go that well. Obviously, they're invested in him. If he gets it back with this offseason program, uh, you know, a full year under his belt with this franchise, his upside is there. It's just a matter of do you believe it's going to happen? That has to be pure speculation and projection. I, I am on the side where I don't believe he's going to be an elite quarterback this season. You two believe he'll get back to his old ways. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a small thing. Nine is not his old ways. Yes, a small sample last year too, like you said. I mean, the last two year, the last two games, he was eight and six. Managed to piece those together. Um, played Houston. You just talked about them, the worst matchup for quarterbacks in week one. Played in Cincinnati. Played against Baltimore. Played against New Orleans defense. I think he. I think he's being undervalued. But QB nine is not QB five, like Mike was saying. Yeah. Um, I think that they need to let him throw the football. And we may be very happy with, you know, him being able to, like a lot of his, his value was elusiveness. And so can he get back to, to doing that? And what will that mean, Mike, for the wide receivers? I mean, Amari Cooper came through last year. He had a, a big year. I mean, wasn't nearly as good. I mean, nothing, nothing was nearly as good as soon as Deshaun Watson was on the field for the Cleveland Browns. But you have a lot more time now to get it going. Amari Cooper... I think he's a perfectly acceptable pick at his ADP wide receiver 18 and in, in about the middle of the fourth right now. That that seems fine, you know, fourth and wow, fourth and receiving touchdowns. That's I was going to say like third that, and end zone targets. That seems like the if, if Deshaun Watson isn't a complete disaster, that seems like the absolute floor for Amari Cooper. That's but the wide receiver 18. That's the question of like Watson was so good because I I think he had just his perfect situation. I mean, he was younger, uh, you know, the, at the peak of his athleticism, and he had uh, Hopkins and uh, uh, Will, Will Fuller, Fuller sometimes. Yeah. Will Fuller, but I mean, like the Will Fuller never became. I don't. He didn't reach his potential, but when Will Fuller was on the field, he was usually the fastest guy there, and and he could do certain things. So that I think that offense was just was perfectly set up for what Watson could do do they have that true field stretcher because let's say Amari Cooper plays more of a Hopkins role and I don't know that you I don't know that you have that guy that can really take the top off for the Cleveland where's Browns the D, where's I mean, the DPJ yeah no respect, it, it, it would be it would be people's Jones used to love him oh I yeah and then Deshaun Watson ruined everything but it, like if people's Jones would be the guy if anyone could do it for them I just I'm I'm, I think I'm I'm in the middle of you guys where Jason seems pretty out, uh, on the Browns bounce back. You're in. I'm, I guess I'm in the middle. With in in for my draft pieces, that means like I'm not really, I'm not forcing any of these guys onto my team. I'll put it that way. Nick Chubb was the number one quarterback the first half or running, running yeah, back yeah. the first half of last year. He this is this is the Nick biggest Chubb's question. a lock. This is the biggest question. Because this this is the hype train that is starting to to uh, uh, take off here, Nick Chubb, more passing work. Because if Nick Chubb actually got passing work, he would be a top three running back at the end of the year. It will happen. No, and, not the top three, but he will get more passing work. That's that's a guarantee. What what is more passing work? More passing work means that he's going to be. 45 plus targets and I think it could I think it could go north of there I think he could have 40 he almost receptions. Had, he almost had 45 targets last year so that's not really a massive increase if you look at the depth chart here there just isn't 
you know, it's it kind of like we were talking about with Mixon. They let Kareem Hunt go. They have not replaced him. There's Jerome Ford there. There's there's no draft capital, no money equity, no talent or things that we've seen on the field yet. And then there's a superstar. Uh, Nick Chubb, they're paying him a lot of money, and I think they'll they'll he'll be on the field more. They've talked about him getting more involved, and and I just think it's a necessity. So if he's almost there last year, maybe it's maybe it's something like maybe he's up there. What was the his total receptions last year? Uh, total receptions in the twenties. I'm guessing. I lost. Hold on. You 27. You, 27. Twenty-seven. Yeah, twenty-seven. Yeah, he, so, so thirty-seven it, it, targets. Can he you caught. get to forty? Is the question? Can you catch forty on fifty-eight targets or yeah. something like that? I think that that is in the range of outcomes that we've kind of seen this with Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry over the last couple of years, they've just he's not a pass catcher and he's not just going out there getting a hundred targets, but more and more and more designed plays getting him in space. And guess what? It works. Yeah, good players. They give him the ball and then they do good stuff. Yeah. Uh who wins the division? Give me your winner. I've it's, got the Bengals. It's gonna be the Bengals. Okay. But, and then we're all we're all agreed then. Yeah, but if you let's order the final three. Okay. I go Bengals, Ravens, Steelers, Browns. I'll go Bengals, Browns, Ravens, Steelers. Bengals, Ravens, Steelers, Browns. So I mean, I'm I'm in with Jason. All right. Best ball breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. All right. Back into it, best ball breakdown for this week. There's a new segment every week leading up into the season looking at uh, positive touchdown regression candidates this week. Um, this is a topic that comes up frequently in fantasy. It's very relevant for best ball draft position and the opportunity to take a player that you look at as a touchdown regression candidate, positive regression candidate, and um, – we're going to identify some names. I see you went real, real bold. <laughs> well, it, uh, it, it, it is. It tied in with the divisional breakdown, Mike. Okay. Yeah, no, it's 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 worth. Uh, it's I think it's a worthy mention because it's going to happen. Deontay Johnson's 147 targets and zero touchdowns. He, he is that what you're one. talking about? Well, no, that wouldn't be um, okay. That wouldn't be a success by this metric. It would technically be positive regression. <laughs> But not, but also no, it wouldn't really because because right. you you'd be looking at his career reg- average yes, and right. you'd want him to positively regress to the mean, not to one. That's that's a problem. One would be a huge problem. But what I believe about him, and we didn't talk about the wide receiver, we didn't talk about him as much in the Steelers section of the show. What I, what I like about him is he's the best player. He's the best player in that room by by a wide margin, and he has been for a while. And so when that player. That player demands targets. He makes it easy on his quarterback. And then you're just going to end up with that season where they're in the end zone, just like he's always been. Last year was just really uh, just a, an anomalous year for the for the quarterback. And so in best ball, you know, it's a format that lives and dies with touchdowns. Um, you can swing for the fences on some of these guys to bounce back to where you want them to be. So for my candidate was Deontay. Who do you have, Jason? Yeah, you're going to love who I have. You've talked him up a lot this off season, and I find myself coming around on his, basically on his touchdowns. That's what's really, you know, the more research that I'm doing, the more that I see DK Metcalf should be at nine touchdowns, 10 touchdowns. He should be north of that. You look at his last two seasons, and yes, it was with Russell Wilson, but he had 10 touchdowns. He had 12 touchdowns, and then this last year, only six. And you go, oh, well, that's Geno. Geno was great. Geno threw 30. Geno threw the fourth most touchdowns in the NFL. And if you look at the opportunities, I mean, he led the NFL in end zone targets, 24 end zone targets for DK Metcalf. For some reason, just didn't reel those in. And that's not normal. That's not going to continue to happen forever. The next closest in the league was only at 18 and yet somehow DK Metcalf only scored six touchdowns. There, uh, was, this isn't Julio where he just never got it done. This is a guy that's had 12. He's had 10. Exactly. And if you want to know the best way to project positive regression, it's those really valuable opportunities that are sticky. And if you want to know how sticky they are, Andrew Cooper had a great tweet uh, on Twitter. Here's the players that have seen 14-plus end zone targets the last two years in a row. Justin Jefferson, Stephon Diggs, Jamar Chase, and DK Metcalf. 
Here's the players who have done it three years in a row. DK Metcalf. Here's the players that have done it four years in a row. DK Metcalf. He going to get his. Yeah, because he's a monster. He's, yes. hum he's, he's humongous. And if I was a quarterback and I saw him running up against these tiny little men, I would throw it at him. Absolutely. So he's, and normally it works out. You know he's going to get his opportunities around the goal line, and he's going to come down with him. So I actually I, bumped him up did you? in the UDK for okay. his touchdown number. And um, Yeah, right now we have a wide – you know, it's tough to bet on the – with your rankings, it's tough to bet on that touchdown category. When it, when that's the predominant category that the player makes his contribution in, those are tough mm -hmm. bets. Like, I did it with Mike Williams before, and it didn't work out, even though Mike Williams was very involved because those touchdowns are hard to project and predict. So, you know, I've got Metcalf up at 10, but obviously I'm betting on him returning to this level. Mike's got him at 28, um, which, look, is where he's going to be if he can't get into the end zone. So... Uh, I do want to say this before Mike shares a name. I have a feeling we're going to hear from the the positive regression crew on Twitter because oh, that language care. is already it's been brought up so many times. I'm just warning you guys. No, it it it, it does not bother. Me. And if for that crew, the reason we use that verbiage because the correct verbiage is simply to say regress. But when when you are having conversation, you and you say the word regress, it has a negative connotation. In our everyday life, when something regresses, it is bad. It technically means either direction, but so I, th I think that there is nothing wrong with just specifying positive regression. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a normal math term, but people hear it and yeah. they get they get angry. Yeah, no, get out. Uh, of here. Mike, give me your name. The round mound of touchdown, baby. We're going with Ramondre Stevenson. I am just I am all in on Ramondre he had 12 carries inside the five that only turned into two touchdowns I, I I I watched him Mike yeah and I watched him fumble like three times in a row and I wanted to die hey because he was giving him those opportunities like you said I I think the opportunities will still be there and and he so he he underperformed in terms of uh yards to touchdowns rushing yards to touchdowns and he uh, even slightly underperformed in receiving yards. He should have had another receiving touchdown with how many receptions and receiving yards he put up. And he was still he was fantastic last year. And you just convert a couple more of those carries inside the goal line and and into a few touchdowns, and you're talking about a true difference oh, maker I, at the running back position. Mike, I'm very terrified at that proposition. I because, because you traded him because I traded him and I and I traded him for a player that that. Uh, performed in the other direction J josh jacobs that i look i if i was betting money i'm betting on josh jacobs well ahead of Ramondre this year but i Which do understandable i do see the path to them being much tighter and fan and fantasy finish at the end of the year and this is just another another bullet point in to that effect the fact that he only got in the ends on two times on 12 attempts inside the five which is kind of insane yeah um, it it happens because it happened to ETN, 23 carries inside the five, only four touchdowns. Mixon, legendary performance of 28 carries inside the five, only six touchdowns. It it happens, and then and then that thing can swing the other direction. Now, all of this is, as of this recording, Dalvin Cook is not a New England Patriot. Yeah. Should Dalvin Cook become a New England Patriot? I do, not, Zeke. I do not stand by this analysis. <laughs> yeah, I think Zeke would get those opportunities too because yeah. obviously Ramondre has, is not the case, like Metcalf, of a history of doing it a bunch of times. Right. So you could look at it as a team and they could go, he can't do it well, so we'll give it to somebody else. That's still There's a possibility. A, like, uh, for, for the confidence in Mixon, you know, for that to go back to that conversation, who else on the Patriots is going to do it? Right now, it is Ramondre. Yeah. <laughs> um, at least we think they I, they do have a history. Yeah, yeah. They, but, the, the Kevin Harris's and Pierre Strong's and we're. I mean, they've used small guys around the end zone uh, before. So Danny shocking. Woodhead. Yes, yeah. It was so, uh, so Bill, shocking. Bill's a little crazy. He yes. Oh yeah. Uncle Bill is a little bit crazy. But it was it was so shocking that they. It to this point they've still done nothing. Like they the only thing that they've done is they brought in James Robinson. They went. Nah, man, not that, it. That ain't it. it. And then, they, and then they they caught him. Like they, they've improved the opportunity for Ramondre. They do seem like one of those places you're going to be holding your breath all off season. Yes. And then if Ramondre makes it through, like he did the draft, congratulations to all of you. It's going to be. He's good. still going to be the guy because the longer you wait, the less important that player is to the team when they bring him in. All right, that was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. Get your first deposit 
matched up to $100 using the code BALLERS. That is it for today's episode of the show. I hope the show positively regressed to our mean Mm. of success, but we'll be back with another one on Saturday, three a week right now. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.